today we enter a new phase of our um, series about what it means to be United Methodist. And uh, for the next five weeks, we're looking at a little book from Steve Harper called The Five Marks of a Methodist. And each week we'll talk about different characteristics of what it means to be a Methodist. So, you know, I was, I was looking at this and reading and thinking about this this week. And I don't know about you, but I love to um, listen to podcasts and TED Talks about happiness, happiness and well-being. Um, how can we design a life for ourselves where we're happy and have a sense of well-being? And usually there are a bunch of different areas that we can have well-being. Earlier in the year, we did a, um, a class on finances that was called Saving Grace. And the, the sub of that book, subtitle of that book is a guide to financial well-being. And so when we have a sense of well-being in all of these different areas of our lives, uh, we have a sense of being people who are happy, people who are fulfilled. But there are some uh, psychologists that have looked into this a little bit more, and they've said, how, how can we actually have lasting happiness? So we know that sometimes uh, pleasure-seeking things, like I know we've got a, a family on a cruise right now, and I'm sure they are having all kinds of pleasure and happiness. But uh, what they've learned is that when we, we seek pleasure as a goal, that a lot of times it's not lasting. It's kind of like that, that first bite of Oreo cheesecake is really great. But then all the bites after that are not as good. And then we also have to step up the pleasure to keep that going, that now we can't only have Oreo cheesecake, we've gotta have Oreo cheesecake with chocolate sauce on it, and that will be what gives us pleasure. So they've looked into things about how can we have more, more deep, deep pleasure that lasts. And so the other things that they've found are engagement, uh, engagement with other people, engaging with important work, uh, being, being present to the things in our life, and also living a life that has meaning, doing meaningful things that make the world a better place. Uh, some of the studies have shown that uh, they measured the happiness of people who went out and bought things for themselves against people who used their resources to enrich the lives of other people. And they found that, that using their resources to enrich the lives of other people was something that provided a deep sense of happiness. And so uh, as we look at these five marks of a Methodist, to me, a lot of these things really fit in with what psychologists have learned about happiness. And, um, and I don't want us to have a false sense of happiness. It doesn't mean that we never have trials or we never have sadness. We have all of the full range of emotions. But how do we live fully into an engaged and into a meaningful life? So we're also looking at this as it relates to being a member of a church. And I, I think sometimes we don't really state our expectations of what it means to be a member of a church. So you should have received a handout today that's got some information about what, what we ask when people take membership vows to be members of our church. And we're gonna receive some new members in, in a couple of weeks. And so that whole first page, um, or most of the first page, comes from our Book of Discipline. And this is what we, uh, we ask people to say in their membership vows. And so um, as we take a look at that, um, when, when people first join the church, one of the groups we ask them to join is a class called a Disciples Path. And a Disciples Path goes through uh, these different areas of how we, we state our membership vows. So the one that's highlighted there is that we promise to support the church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And I think some people see that as like an a la carte, like, I think I'll pray this week, <laughs> and next week maybe I'll go to worship, and then the week after that maybe I'll uh, throw some money in the offering plate. But all of these, all of these different things that we, that we promise as a church together are some of the ways that we stay vital in our faith, that we continue growing, we continue being engaged in doing something meaningful, which we know leads to true happiness, uh, but it's also a way that we're vital together as a church. We know that we're not alone when we do this together. So in this study, we learned that there's a lot more to being a member of a church than just attending on Sunday. 
And there's definitely more to being a member of a church than just having your name on a roster. So you are invited to an active transformational life where you will grow in your love of God and your love of other people by giving yourself through every area of your life. Now, this is not a checklist of how to be a good Christian or how to earn God's love or how to earn God's grace. But instead, it's, it's a way that we have learned to respond to God's love. So, uh, so the love of God is, is the first thing. God loves every single one of us. And so when we're talking about a Methodist that loves God, it's because we've felt that God loves us. I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you meet somebody new, and if you're kind of an introvert like me, you might like not be the first one to, to really uh, say welcoming things. You might wait until that other person says nice things, and then you say, okay, they're a nice person. I can, I can be nice to them. There are people in our congregation, and I don't think Charlie's here today, but Charlie Sin is the one that just sticks out, stands out to me as he comes up and he meets you, and right away he just... He just radiates God's love. He, he welcomes you. He'll give you a big handshake or a hug, and he'll just say, you know, I'm glad you're here, um, and, you know, some other compliment, and just a, just a um, sunshiny guy who just really makes you feel loved. And so it's really easy to respond to Charlie. Hey, I like you too. <laughs> you know? and, um, and so with God loving us first, God is just shining down this love on us, that is so powerful that we can't help but respond to that love. And so uh, God works in, in each of us to, to grow that sense of love in our hearts. And God works through the relationships, just like the disciples that Jesus had. These disciples walked with Jesus. They, they gave their lives to this work, and they learned from him, and they, they allowed themselves to be changed in this process. When we make the decision to follow Jesus, we also allow ourselves to be changed. We want to grow as disciples from the, the first time that we're itty-bitty disciples until we grow into great, big, mature disciples. And so um, this is an expression for us of an act of faith that requires uh, us to, um, to love ourselves first as God loves us. And then to allow the expression of that love radiate out in our engagement with our church family and in our church community. And so sometimes we're so used to uh, rules and checklists that, that we're afraid that God doesn't love us because we're not doing the right things or we're not doing enough or that God just wants us for what we can do. And that's totally wrong. Um, any of these things that we do is to express our gratitude and our love for the grace of God that we already have in our lives. In our lives. I have one of the quotes from the book that I, I really love. I think we've got this up on the screen. Uh, it says, There is no greater day in the Christian life than when we discover that salvation means wholeness. It doesn't merely mean going to heaven when we die. It means living abundantly while we are here. But for this to happen, says Jesus, says Wesley, we must love God. And so one of the, the first marks of the Methodist is that sense of knowing that, that we're not trying to achieve a checklist, we're not trying to, to be good enough. We are simply uh, being God's children and just returning the love that God has given to us. Uh, the next one that we have up here says that Having received God's love first, as it says in 1 John 4.19, we love God in return with everything we are and have. We do it in relation to every aspect of our life. We do it every day and to everyone. This is the first and foremost mark of a disciple. Now, I was thinking about this, um, you know, when we talk about what a disciple looks like, um, flash on these weird memories every now and then, but my, my mom was really gung-ho about supporting the Girl Scouts when I was a brownie. I was a very cute brownie, and back then um, we had very like formal little uniforms. And um, so my mom really saw being in the Girl Scouts and me being involved in the Girl Scouts was, it was almost like a, you know, 
how to be kind and ladylike, you know? And her whole vision of being a Girl Scouts was kind of her 50s housewife uh, vision about, you know, every hair in place and, you know, your socks will be at the right height. And, and a, a lot of the outward appearances of being a Girl Scout was, was what my mom was really uh, concerned with. So one conversation at a family reunion, she was telling one of her sisters, trying to recruit one of her sisters to be a Girl Scout leader. And so she had this whole character of a Girl Scout leader. And so she was describing this woman whose home was perfectly kept, and there were these, you know, uh, craft activities that were just perfect for the age level of every child. And, and my mom kept going on and on about this, uh, this perfect appearance of the Girl Scout leader. And at that point, her sister reminded her of her other sister, who actually was a Girl Scout leader, <laughs> And this was a lady who was more likely to be wearing a t-shirt with a cigarette hanging out of the side of her mouth, um, and uh, definitely not the cleanest house in the neighborhood. But this, this one aunt that I had loved being a Girl Scout leader. She really got into all the messiness of camp. She loved the kids, and um, she wasn't anything like the character that my mom described, but she lived the heart of a Girl Scout leader and really believed in, in the way that she was forming and developing uh, all of those, those girls that were under her care. So when we look at, at uh, how John Wesley was trying to navigate this character of a Methodist, uh, one of the things that, that he realized is that we sometimes have things that we think are marks of a Methodist, but that they, they really are not. So in his sermon, the, the character of a Methodist, he talks about some of those things. So the, the very first thing that he said that we're not is that it's not about our opinions. And it's kind of interesting because this is way back in uh, John Wesley's time, 18th century. And so we, we kind of think that he's got a glimpse into our lives now. But sometimes we think being in church is all about our own opinions and what we think it is. And uh, I've even heard people say, well, what church means to me is, <laughs> and then they'll go on to talk about how the church should be entertaining and, and should serve them. Uh, but it's not about what, what we think. It's not about our own opinions. Um, he also talks about uh, the kind of language we use or the kind of fancy words. Uh, we've got some very uh, scholarly people here in our congregation. And so sometimes some of us uh, are intimidated by, uh, by the level of conversation that, that some people use. And we think, oh, I could never pray in front of people because I don't really have the words to do that. Or, you know, I'm going to sound, I'm not going to sound smart. And so he says it's not about that. It's about having this heart for God, about loving God. And it's not that we just take one of these, these issues that we think is holy, but it's that we open our whole selves, our whole lives to the holiness of God. Um, in that sermon, he says um, that, a Methodist is one who has the love of God shed abroad in his heart by the Holy Ghost given unto him, one who loves the Lord his God with all his heart and with all of his soul and all of his mind and all of his strength. God is the joy of his heart, the desire of his soul, which is constantly crying out, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My God and my all, thou art my strength of my heart and my portion forever. So this love of God, you know, we, we all want to have that. We all want to feel the joy of having the love of God. And we know that sometimes we go through things that we just, we just don't feel very joyful. And so in those times, that's when it is, is so vital for all of us to have a faith that is an active faith that we can count on, that we can walk through. Uh, you know, our church has been through a difficult time, and... Uh, as we think about some of those that we've lost, I think um, when, we, when we think of these, uh, these church people that have passed away recently, we apply this marks of a Methodist to them, and we, we, we see their love of God radiating through everything they did. Um, people that just served the church for so many years, and, uh, and their engagement in how they serve changed over time. I know like John Chambliss, you know, was uh, at one point just, you know, actively involved in all kinds of physical things in the food bank, and, and he's probably served on, had probably served on every committee, 
And, uh, and towards the end, he was, he was bringing it in a little bit more, um, was really faithful in, in serving with the Tuscarora Shepherds, leading a Sunday school class. And, um, and so sometimes as we grow and change, uh, we sometimes specialize a little bit more of what we really want to spend our time doing. Uh, but this, as this um, little brochure that you have says, um, there are ways that each one of these activities grows us in our love of God. If we look at some of those activities, and there are some that make us defensive, and sometimes people get defensive about money, it's really an area to, to pray about to pray about what does God want to see happen with my financial well-being. If, if we don't think we should be part of a small group, we could look at that and say, why is it that I don't want to engage with other Christians and talk about my faith with other people? If we don't want to serve in the community, why is that? Are we afraid? Uh, do we have a fear of serving? Um, and sometimes we hear the word evangelism and we, you know, we totally close up because we don't want to be one of those people knocking on doors um, asking people about their faith. And so that's, that's not what's required. But sharing the joy that we have is sharing our witness. So uh, Friday night, Janet and I had the opportunity to go serve at Family Promise at uh, Winter Park United Methodist. And um, my secret weapon for the evening was my grandchildren. And so I brought my grandchildren to come along. And, um, and I told them that we were going to be visiting with families that uh, they were there staying in this place because they, they didn't have a home to live in. And um, so I, was, I, I wanted them to be free to play, but I also didn't want them to ask a lot of questions about, you know, where they lived and things like that. And so I was just so excited with the enthusiasm my grandchildren had about going to uh, meet new children and to, uh, to, to serve. And I said, you know, we're not there. You're going to be able to play but we're not there so much for you, uh, but we're there to really uh, host this family, to really be there for them, to make them comfortable, and to, um, to really engage them in, in just a, a fun night. And so they were, they were all in, 100% on that. And Janet is so good with kids. <laughs> Janet's over there, like, you know, with all the kids playing Uno and, and uh, you know, playing all these games. And it was just such a beautiful expression that night of community, of what happens when we come together and we, we just share the love of God with each other. So I know we were, we were very moved by the families. They were just wonderful. They had... Um, their kids like shared all kinds of uh, fun about their lives and what they're doing and we just had a, a really great time and so sometimes when we think about serving that word serve to some people sounds like it sounds like it's going to be drudgery but there are so many things that we can do to serve God that light us up inside that make us feel just as excited uh, as, as some of the other things that we do that we would think of as more recreational. So this little guide that I, I gave you today is sort of a draft form of, uh, we're going to be forming a discipleship team over the next few months. And in that team, what we want to do is try to engage the people in our congregation in an active life. We want the mark of the United Methodists at Tuscawilla to be people who love God and radiate God. And sometimes when we look at every single one of these things, we have the choice to either choose God or choose ourselves. And so many times we choose ourselves because, you know, we just feel like we're tired or we're too busy or there's too many things going on. But a lot of these are ways that we can actively serve God and engage with other people. And all of these things are ways that give our life meaning. So this three-year guide here should not be taken as a legalistic checklist of what makes a person a Christian or a Methodist. Assessing the love of God in one's heart cannot be measured in such a way, just like the love uh, for a spouse or a child cannot be indicated by a list of do's and don'ts. But it can help us to think about how we are living our lives in these different areas of our membership vows. I remember uh, one time when I was um, really struggling in a marriage and things were just really not going well and it seemed like 
it seemed like it was a lot of drudgery, that it was like cleaning the house, taking care of kids, and uh, we were just at each other all the time, just fighting all the time. And we went to see a therapist, and the therapist said, do you have a regular date night? And we were like, well, yeah, not since the kids were born. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, what do you do for fun? And we kind of looked at each other like, oh, what is that? Like, what are, you, <laughs> what are you talking about fun? And so her first suggestion for us was that we go on a date. You know, as a married couple, we get a babysitter, we go on a date, and we reconnect and we remember what it was like to, you know, when we were dating, um, to really feel that love of our relationship. And it was so amazing. I remember we went bowling and just had a great time. It was just goofy and silly, and we just really loved being together. And then as soon as we got home, we found out that our, um, I guess she was three years old then, had jumped off the coffee table and split her ear open, and we had to go right from date night to the emergency room. <laughs> um, but we still remembered like how wonderful that night was. And so um, sometimes when we think about our love of God, uh, we need to have that special time that we plan to spend with God, that time that we are just in the presence of God, enjoying God in our lives. Um, we did a, an exercise in our staff meeting the other night where we just sat in silence and tried to imagine uh, what it would feel like to have God's love warming each of us like the rays of a sun. You know, what would it feel like just to, to just feel God's presence with each one of us? And so many times our, our faith is not that, that love and fun and connection with God, but instead it's like what we don't do or what we're not supposed to do. And so, um, so when we engage in this, uh, this, these loving actions, one of the things that happen is that our human relationships reflect the love that we have for God and it's reflected to the people that God loves. If we don't take any actions, like us not having a date night, there's really not much of a relationship there. God is always loving us. God is always pouring out love and grace. But sometimes we kind of just put a, a lid on our, our cup and say, no, I don't, I don't want that right now. I'm just going to go be secluded in, in my own space. But when we open up our arms to what God has for us, we really feel the power of God's love and grace with us. So these are, are merely suggestions that I give you in this little brochure today for how a person might live out their membership vows uh, taken to support the church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. They're a response to God's grace. And uh, one of the things that, that Steve Harper talks about is that these uh, means of grace are channels, not formulas. It's not like, okay, if I take one from each list, then boom, I'm good. I'm going into heaven. I'm going to have a gold paved driveway, and I'm going to have an extra crown. Instead, these are ways that if we want to receive more of God's grace, we're opening our own hearts to be able to take in more of what God is already pouring out. Um, he would say, Steve Harper would say that um, John Wesley called people holy solitaries, and that was not a compliment, <laughs> to be a holy solitary, that we need each other, that we need to be together as a church, that we need um, to, to love each other, and that the church is never singular, that we are the body of Christ, we are not privatized spirituality. And so all, all of this means that as we seek to grow in holiness, our character and our, our conduct, our inward holiness, is followed by outward holiness. So the, the nature of our heart, um, growing that in God's love and changing that and shaping that in God's love, helps us to have actions that help us show God's love uh, more effectively. And so I just, I pray for our church as we, as we all decide how to be engaged in our life as disciples, how we decide what we want to do as Tuscawilla United Methodist Church, how do we want to go out there and show people in the world that need the love of God what that looks like? What kind of example do we want to be for people who maybe their life is all about seeking pleasure? Or maybe their life is so difficult that they don't have any pleasure in it at all. 
And how can we be those, those examples of God's love? The very first thing that we have to do is we have to experience it ourselves. So I want to just close now with a prayer where we take a moment and we just invite God to be in our hearts in a powerful way. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we love you. We are here in this church today, either in this building or online today, because we come here to worship you. We want to love you. We want our lives to be changed by you. And we want to be your followers. God, we know that we don't do this perfectly, that we are uh, sinful people, and that even when we have the best intentions, sometimes we, uh, we don't always do the right thing. But we know that we can change and we can grow. And that every time we grow closer to you, that we grow in our own sense of holiness. So I pray that each person today would just take a moment and just experience the power of your love working in their lives. I pray that you would heal whatever anyone has that needs healing. And I pray that you would give each person a sense of, of your grace that they can, they can feel in their heart, that they can have the assurance that you are with them and that you love them and that you are guiding them toward that, that happy, engaged, meaningful life that we all seek. So God, we just offer these, these few moments of silence for each person to experience your love in them. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.